Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again, Lord, that we can gather together around your word tonight, and we pray the Holy Spirit will guide and direct us into all truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so continuing our series called Understanding the Jews, this is now lesson number 34, and last week uh, we were studying through the three most important repositories of rabbinic literature, the Mishnah, the Gemara, and the Midrash. And we were able to get through the first two, and now tonight we're going to look at the third, uh, which is a look at the Jewish Midrash. So the word Midrash means interpretation, and it's yet another layer uh, of explanation as to what the Bible, or in the Jews' case, the Tanakh, means and what it's saying to the Jew. And it is in the Midrash that we finally find the reason why the whole of the oral tradition, which includes all three of those items, the Mishnah, the Gemara, and the Midrash, but why they were not allowed to be written down prior to 190 A.D. So the Jews believe that in addition to the written Torah, God also gave Moses the oral law, which more fully explains the written law. And those oral traditions uh, were intended to be passed down from generation to generation and kept, listen, exclusively within the Jewish community. Okay. But why was it not permitted for them to reduce it to writing? Well, according to the Midrash, God foresaw that if the oral traditions were in fact written down in Hebrew, it was only going to be a matter of time before it was copied into Greek and then into other non-Jewish languages. And those traditions would have been published and circulated as if they were the laws of God entrusted, listen, not just to the Jews, but to other Gentile nations as well. As those other Gentile nations, a lot of times and almost synonymously, are referred to back and forth as either uh, Gentiles or Greeks. So a lot of times when you see Greeks, it's really talking to any non-Jewish nation. But that was a circumstance that was to be avoided uh, because only the Jews were entrusted with God's law. And only the Jews were to have the full interpretation thereof. And by tightly keeping the interpretation strictly within the Jewish community, they would maintain their position as the chosen possessors of the oracles of God's law. And that was the state of affairs for many centuries until the circumstances that we reviewed last week forced the Jews to write down those oral traditions. And that was to avoid the danger of some or all of them being lost. So, those are the whys as to how we got from oral tradition to written literature. So, we've already reviewed the main purposes for the Mishnah and the Gemara. But what needs to remain for us now uh, is that why or at least what needs to be discussed by us and considered by us as to, as to why, there, if we've got the, the Gemara and we've got uh, the Mishnah, why do we need a third level now of interpretation? What's the point? Well, one of the reasons is found in the way that the Midrash is laid out. Uh, we've observed that in the Mishnah and the Gemara, uh, they're presented by topic, subject matter. The Midrash is different. Uh, it follows the actual order of the Hebrew Bible. And when all is said and done, it really is the Midrash that has the final word 
when it comes to explanations of the Jewish sacred text, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. So the Midrash was actually redacted, collected, and reduced to a single document uh, between 400 A.D. and 1200 A.D. And it's undisputed that over those centuries, the rabbis who were working on this added to it and added to it and added to it. The Midrash is liter literature like none other. And even the Jews have a hard time really in giving a definition uh, of it that can be stated concisely. Uh, in James Kugel's book called The Bible As It Was, he states that the Midrash is an overwhelmingly broad field of inquiry. He says that it is the foundation stone of rabbinical Judaism. And it's as diverse as Jewish creativity itself. So the Midrash is a collection of books on top of books. Sometimes uh, the person revising the Midrash would put his name on it. Other times uh, it would continue to be holding the same title that it had previously, even though there were additions to it. Uh, that seems a little odd, but that's the fact of the matter. There really are no clear lines of separation. But gradually, over time, this entire mass of traditions and legends and explanations has come down and is known to us today collectively as the Midrash. And it gets into great detail on a host of questions that could be raised about a range of disparate disciplines, from grammar and syntax uh, to the meaning of unclear words and phrases. Uh, it addresses apparent ambiguities. It attempts to fill in uh, that which is kind of between the lines in Scripture. Uh, it updates Scripture to conform with changing ethical standards. It enhances, it augments, uh, it explains, it justifies, all of those things. Suffice it to say uh, that I can't scratch the surface on the contents of the Jewish Midrash. But I will give you just one example, just one, of how it works. And the example I've chosen is from the Midrashic thinking concerning Psalm 145. So let's go to Psalm 145 right now and read through this psalm. The scripture reads, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. 
Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Psalm 145. So this Psalm 145 holds special interest because it's one of the Psalms that is referred to as an alphabetical psalm. What is that? Pretty much how it sounds, uh, an alphabetical psalm is really an acrostic where each line or each group of lines in the psalm begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. Hence, well, alphabetical. And by the way, just in passing, we probably own our own English word alphabet to the G. Uh, most people take it for granted that it comes from the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha and beta. But the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, are aleph and bet. And according to Britannica, the Hebrew alphabet is older than the Greek. Nonetheless, there are nine such alphabetical psalms in the Bible that fall into this category. And in every case except one, the pattern aligns in a range from one half of a verse up to two verses. The exception to that pattern is Psalm 119. Now you may be thinking, Psalm 119, yeah, that's the longest psalm in the Bible. And as we talked about earlier, there are only 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So Psalm 119 is just way too long uh, for the normal pattern to fit. That's true. But 119 is still, Psalm 119 is still an acrostic. But it's an acrostic that recycles after every eight verses. So eight sections, you got 22 letters in the alphabet, right? Eight times 22 is 176 verses. Behold, that's exactly how many verses are in Psalm 119. So they figured out a way to include even the longest psalm in the Bible to fit the pattern. But Psalm 145 has a different reason for being unique. In looking at Psalm 145, uh, did any of you notice anything that seemed a little curious regarding its status as an alphabetical psalm? Probably not, because I didn't explain to you until after I read it. But how many letters did we say are in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. And how many verses are in Psalm 145, full, 21. What you're going to find out if you follow, in the, follow the pattern of the acrostic is that all other letters in the Hebrew alphabet do appear in order at the beginning of each verse in that Psalm 145, except for one. There is one missing, and it's the 14th letter. The letter N in Hebrew, spelled N-U-N, but pronounced Nun. That letter's missing. It's not there. This is a case, and remember, we're talking about an example. I'm going to keep reminding you of this, of the Midrash. This is an example where the Jewish Midrashist, that's a writer of the Midrash, is going to step in. Now, remember... Again, I'm going to keep reminding you, this is an example, just so you know why I'm doing this. The Midrashists will pose some questions. 
and he's going to offer some explanation. The primary question here is pretty obvious. Why is there no verse starting with the letter N? Is it a copying error? Did it somehow get misplaced or omitted during transmission? Well, according to the rabbinic tradition that comes out of the Babylonian schools, uh, there is a different explanation. Rabbi Yohanan stated in the Midrash that the end verse was intentionally omitted by David. We would say the Holy Spirit, right? And David omitted it because the downfall of Israel begins with that letter. And he's referring to the dire warning made by the prophet Amos in Amos 5.2. So let's go there and see what that says. Amos 5.2, the scripture reads, The virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. Now, the Hebrew phrasing of the first half of this verse is a little different. Because in the Tanakh, it reads like this. She has fallen and will no more rise, comma, the virgin of Israel. Now, according to Rabbi Yohanan, instead of David writing something along those lines in Psalm 145, they say he looked forward into the future, and he saw that statement by Amos. And he saw that it was only temporary. And so David penned verse 14 that we find in Psalm 145 in place of and instead of the end verse. And the result is that now verse 14 is much more uplifting and satisfying. Let's go back and look at it again. Now, think of what we just read about in Amos back here. Let me go back again. The virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. Now let's look at 145. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Hmm. Well, I mentioned that Rabbi Yohanan was from the Babylonian school. Because there's a different take on this problem if you seek guidance from the Palestinian school, also known as the Jerusalem school. The Palestinian school attempts to remove the apparent contradiction that we see here between 145 and Amos 5.2 by actually doing a little tweaking of Amos 5.2. How so? Well, with just a little tiny, tiny addition. And if ever the phrase, a little difference makes all the difference, if it has an application, this would be one of those occasions. The original translation reads, She has fallen and will no more rise, the virgin of Israel. That clearly means that Israel will fall, and her fall will be permanent. But notice what the Midrashists of the Palestinian school had done. They simply added a semicolon after the word <clears throat> more. They also changed the word or the article the to simply o. Oh. That change doesn't really have any consequence. But let's go back and take a look at this now. Back to Amos 5.2. And I did say at the beginning here, I'm going to use my red dot where it says the, they just changed that to O version instead of the version. That really doesn't have any consequence. But over here, you see the word more here, and right here where I've got my dot between the word more and the word rise, oh, they added a semicolon here. What does that do? 
Well, that changes everything. Now the phrase reads, she has fallen and will no more. Semicolon right here. Israel has fallen and she shall no more. And then they switch this around and they put this phrase in the beginning at the back end and it reads, O Virgin of Israel. That semicolon changes what was a negative into a positive. Completely reverses the meaning from Israel never rising again to Israel never falling again. Do you see that? Do you see? Do you think punctuation doesn't make any difference? Do you see what happens here? So if you're like me, you should be thinking, how do they justify such a change? Well, according to the sages of Israel, David originally was to record verse 14 of Psalm 145 in accordance and in harmony with the thought expressed in Amos 5.2. But, listen, they say he changed his mind. He repented of it. And by inspiration... Instead of writing down that original thought that begins with the Hebrew letter N, Nun, he wrote down the verse 14 that we see in our Bibles today, a verse that starts with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Samek, S-A-M-E-K-H. So, let's go back to Psalm 145 and just look at verse 14 and see how this reads now. The scripture reads, The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Now, this verse is much more acceptable to the Jewish reader and it is much more comforting. The problem is that this verse is general in nature. And it's underscoring the truth that only God can raise up those that are fallen. The passage in Amos is not general. It's specific to Israel. And it doesn't speak to what God can do, but rather what he will do, specifically to Israel. Strangely enough, the Midrashists are not sheepish about this at all. In fact, they view this as a great accomplishment. They not only answer the question about the missing letter in Psalm 145, but they've also at the same time removed what was an objectionable warning that is present in Amos 5.2. No shame in adulterating God's word. Here they applaud themselves really for their cleverness and their ingenuity. And make no mistake, uh, the sages who construct the Midrash put a very high value on their creativity. Their creativity is founding on the scriptures and resolving issues they view to be problematic. Don't like to have problems. That mindset's not new, is it? Uh, it's no wonder that Jesus called out the Jewish doctors by telling them that by their tradition, they had made the law of none effect. They had placed layer upon layer upon layer of man's thoughts on top of God's word to the point that God's original intent had been obscured, had been lost. So, that little exercise, the one we just went through, I hope gives you some understanding as to what the Midrash is all about. That's one example. But as we end this segment, I want to share some words with you that are not my own. They're not my own. They belong to Dr. Jacob Neusner. Now, he passed away back in 2016 but he is credited 
was single-handedly creating the field of religious Jewish study in America. And here's a pretty honest observation that he made about the Jewish Midrash. Remember, not my words, but his. In fact, this is a quotation. Quote, Midrash minimizes the authority of the text as communication, i.e., normal language. It places the focus on the reader and the personal struggle, struggle of the reader to reach an acceptable moral application of the text. While it is always governed by the wording of the text, it allows for the reader to project his or her inner struggle into the text. This allows for some very powerful interpretations, which, to the ordinary user of language, seem to have very little connection with the text. The great weakness of this method is that it always threatens to replace the text with an outpouring of personal reflection. At its best, it requires the presence of mystical insight not given to all readers. Close quote. So, that's, to me, a pretty stiff indictment coming from a Jewish person, a Jewish educator. So while the Midrash is too large a subject to summarize succinctly, you at least now have enough of a sense about it to add some context to the issues that we're talking about whenever the term is invoked. So now when you hear Midrash, I hope you have some understanding of what that means. And with highlighting now the Mishnah, the Gemara, and the Midrash, uh, you've got a some background of the core of rabbinic literature. And it's really undisputed that these three works have more influence and give more direction to the life of the Jew than does scripture itself. That's what they rely on, folks. It was that way in Jesus' time, and it is that way now whether those traditions are written or oral, it has the same effect, carries the same weight. Essentially speaking, if you are a Jew and you want to know how to conduct yourself in any given situation, you should be able to find a midrash on the subject. It may give you multiple opinions. Uh, it may give you a judgment or a conclusion. It may not. Now, oftentimes, it's actually left up to the reader to make their own choice between the possibilities that are offered. Of course, I knew I wouldn't find any direct connection between the Midrash and divine authority. But as you can see, I did find what I thought was a pretty shocking admission that the Midrash has some serious shortcomings. So much so that it really shouldn't be used as a spiritual guide that is relied on more than God's word. Keeping in mind that while I myself commonly refer to the Midrash as commentary, uh, the Jews themselves profess that it is much more than that. So, that completes our side study on the primary text of rabbinic literature, and I hope you found it profitable. So, next week, we're going to return, yes, to the celebration of the Passover feast. It's been a while, we've got to get back to it, uh, as it is uh, observed in the Jewish Seder meal. So, please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list, and until next week, Shalom. Shalom.